So Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance has impaneled a special grand jury to investigate Donald Trump and the Trump Organization. What does that really mean? And how does a grand jury go about doing its business, deciding whether to indict somebody for criminal charges or not? Let's talk about that. Because understanding the way a grand jury operates, like justice, matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. Well, I'm sure you've seen the reports by now. Here's one example, a headline from the New York Daily News. Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance Jr. convenes grand jury to weigh criminal charges against Trump and his business executives. And of course, in the Trump Organization, his business executives are largely his family members. So what does it actually mean? that District Attorney Vance has impaneled a special grand jury to investigate Donald Trump and the Trump Organization. Well, first of all, it does not guarantee that Trump or the Trump Organization will be indicted. But this is the last stop on the road to a criminal indictment. I've been getting a lot of questions about, you know, what the grand jury is, how does it operate, what does it take? to return an indictment, for the grand jury to criminally charge somebody. So let's try to go through some of these frequently asked questions to understand how grand juries operate. So first of all, the grand jury is an arm of the court. It's not an arm of the prosecutor's office. The chief judge of the jurisdiction in which the grand jury sits sends out grand jury notices, summons grand jurors, citizens, to come and sit for a period of time on a grand jury. Each grand jury consists of 23 people. Why 23? I don't know. Uh, perhaps somebody knows, but 30 years as a prosecutor, the number's always been 23, and I'm not quite sure why. But 23 citizens will be summoned to do grand jury duty. They will be impaneled. Now, it doesn't take all 23 to actually do the business of the grand jury. We have to have at least 16 grand jurors present to do grand jury business. 16 people is a quorum. So I can't tell you how many mornings when I was a federal prosecutor, I would stand outside the grand jury room door waiting for that 16th grand juror to arrive. So they had a quorum and I could begin presenting my witnesses, my evidence, making my arguments to the grand jury. Now, as you probably know, at a criminal trial, a jury trial, any verdict, whether guilty or not guilty, must be unanimous. All 12 jurors must agree on the verdict in order for a jury to return a verdict in a criminal trial. In a grand jury, that's not the case. So you have to have at least 16 people present. You can have as many as 23, but at least 16 to do business. And then in order for the grand jury to vote vote an indictment, vote a criminal charge against somebody, 12 of the grand jurors have to vote in favor of an indictment, of bringing a criminal charge. It could be 12 of 16, that's the least number you can do business with. It could be 12 of 23. But the difference is it doesn't have to be unanimous. It only has to be 12 of the entire group of grand jurors who are sitting at any given time. So that's a pretty significant difference because if there are 16 people, four of them could say, you know what, I'm not quite satisfied that there's enough evidence to indict the target, to bring a criminal charge. But if 12 agree that there is enough evidence, then they can return an indictment. What's the standard to indict somebody? We know that at a criminal jury trial, the standard is the highest standard known to the law beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a very high evidentiary burden. At a grand jury, it's a fairly low evidentiary burden. It's simply probable cause. Probable cause to believe a crime has been committed and the person that the prosecutor is seeking to indict, to criminally charge, is the person who committed it. 
Now we could do an hour on what exactly probable cause means, um, but suffice it to say that it's a much lower standard than beyond a reasonable doubt. Who's allowed in a grand jury? Well, obviously the grand jurors, the prosecutor is allowed in there, and the prosecutor can bring one witness in at a time. And that's it. The grand jurors, the prosecutor, the witness who will testify, and then there's a court reporter taking everything down that is said in the grand jury room. When I was a, a federal prosecutor, I could not bring in my FBI agent who might be the lead in the case. I could not bring in my lead homicide detective in a murder case. I could only bring in the witness. Everybody else has to wait outside. That also goes for the witness's lawyer. Often, when we subpoena witnesses to the grand jury, they're represented by counsel. Their attorney is not permitted to come in to the grand jury room proper. The attorney has to wait outside. And what we do is we accommodate the witness. If, during the course of the witness's testimony, a question is asked and the witness needs some legal advice, no problem. We stop the proceedings. Um, the witness goes outside, talks to his or her lawyer, and then comes back in and resumes their testimony. And I tell the witnesses, please feel free to do that as many times as you, you feel the need to consult with your counsel so that you're completely comfortable testifying before the grand jury. But the attorney cannot come into the room and be in there while the grand jury is conducting business. Grand jury secrecy, deadly important because we wanna protect the identity of the witnesses, we want to protect the identity of the person that we are investigating because it may be that there's not enough evidence to charge that person. It may be that person really didn't commit a chargeable offense. So we don't want people to know that that person's being investigated because that could damage that person's reputation or standing in the community. Um, we also want to um, make sure that the folks that we are investigating don't know that we're investigating them. Now, obviously, in Trump's case, it's a little bit different, but generally, we don't want the targets of the investigation to know because if they knew, then they could tamper with witnesses. They could destroy evidence. They could flee to avoid prosecution. So there are lots of good reasons for the, for the grand jury secrecy rules. So all of the grand jurors are sworn to secrecy. They can't breathe a word of what goes on inside that room behind those closed grand jury room doors. They can't talk about who testifies, what evidence they've seen, what case they're sitting on. In fact, if they did talk about it outside the grand jury room, they could be prosecuted for contempt or possibly other criminal offenses themselves. And in my experience, grand jurors take the, uh, their oath of secrecy very seriously. Similarly, prosecutors have an oath of secrecy. We can't talk about what goes on in the grand jury room once we leave that room. However, witnesses who testify before the grand jury, they don't take an oath of secrecy. There's no gag order. They can run to the cameras. They can go to the media and say, I testified in the grand jury and I said X, Y, and Z. We can't stop them. I always cautioned and counseled the witnesses, no good can come of you publicly discussing what your testimony was in there, but I can't instruct them and there is no legal requirement preventing them from speaking about the testimony that they give before the grand jury. They're not bound by any rules of secrecy. So if 12 people vote to indict, vote to criminally charge, that's called a true bill or an indictment. And then once there is that indictment in the system, the judge will send out a bench warrant to have the target of the investigation, the person who's been indicted, taken into custody, or sometimes it will be a negotiated turn-in, and then that person will appear in court to be arraigned on the indictment. That's the, the formal initiation of the criminal case against the person who's been indicted. If less than 12 grand jurors vote, to indict, to charge somebody. That's called a no bill or a no true bill. And the person is not going to be charged with a criminal offense, at least not by that grand jury at the conclusion of the grand jury's investigation. Now, let's finish up by talking about um, 
why Cy Vance might have now impaneled this special grand jury to sit for six months. Because in New York, grand juries typically only sit for four weeks at a time. Cy Vance has impaneled, or the court has impaneled at Cy Vance's request, this grand jury to sit for six months, three days a week. So it sure seems like Cy Vance is prepared to present all of the evidence that he has been collecting over the last couple years about the possible crimes of Donald Trump, the Trump Organization, the executives, the Trump family members, etc., presented all to the grand jury. You may recall that there have been subpoenas that have been issued over the last couple of years by Cy Vance, largely for documents, right? Remember, Cy Vance is the one who subpoenaed Donald Trump's tax returns and financial documents from his accounting firm, Mazars, and it took a couple of trips to the Supreme Court and a bogus claim of absolute immunity that the Supreme Court rejected that Donald Trump tried to, to claim for Cy Vance to finally get what is reported to be millions of pages of documents, right? So there have been subpoenas issued over time, but now there's this special grand jury. And what I think that means is Cy Vance will be putting all of the witnesses, all of the people he needs to have testify before the grand jury to testify about what they know concerning possible crimes by Trump and company. Why is it important to get live witnesses before the grand jury? It's critically important because this is what's known as locking in the grand jury testimony of a particular witness. Here's why that's important. If a witness makes a statement to an investigator during the course of an investigation that I saw Donald Trump commit crime X, that's all well and good. But if that witness is then called at trial and says, I never saw Donald Trump commit crime X, you could impeach that witness. In other words, you could call the investigator to, to prove to the jury that the witness did say previously he saw Donald Trump commit crime X. That's called impeaching the witness, proving that the witness made an inconsistent statement at an earlier time. But guess what? All that does is prove that the witness is a liar. It doesn't prove, the jury can't use that as proof in the case that Donald Trump committed crime X. That's called being used as substantive evidence. Can't be used as substantive evidence if the witness just said it to an investigator. But if the witness goes before the grand jury, takes an oath to tell the truth, and in that official proceeding under oath says, I saw Donald Trump commit crime X, guess what? When that witness testifies at Donald Trump's trial, if that witness said, I never saw Donald Trump commit crime X. That grand jury testimony, that transcript, can now be given to the jury as actual proof in the case, substantive evidence in the case that Donald Trump committed crime X. But it has to be locked into the grand jury under oath at an official proceeding. That's why it's so important to get all of the relevant witnesses before the grand jury and lock them into that testimony so it can be used to convict the target later on at trial. In essence, I always told my homicide prosecutors and my criminal justice students, you put all of the witnesses before the grand jury because that creates the blueprint for your trial. Because the witnesses can get scared, they, their memories can fade, they can perhaps be approached by the bad guy trying to back them off the incriminating testimony. It's called a witness spinning you, telling a different story at trial than they told the grand jury. Unfortunately, it happened to us all the time in the courts of Washington, D.C., both local and federal. That's why they had to be locked in to their grand jury testimony so that could be used as proof of the crime at trial. That was a very long, <laughs> Um, primer or frequently asked question segment on the grand jury practice, but I, I hope you all found it helpful. And let me finish, I think I promised I was going to finish before, let me finish for real with this. Every data point we have seen coming out of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office 
has been another data point leading to an indictment, leading to a criminal charge, leading to a criminal trial of Trump and company. Why do I say that? Well, for two years, District Attorney Vance was fighting to get those tax records and financial documents, and he finally got them. He then hired expensive forensic accounting firms to unravel what they were seeing in all of these financial documents. And you don't spend lots of New York taxpayer money on expensive financial accounting firms unless you're moving toward an indictment, not away from an indictment. And then Cy Vance brought on to the investigative team, to the prosecution team, an expert, former federal prosecutor, mob prosecutor, white collar crime prosecutor named Mark Pomerantz to be part of the investigative team looking into Trump and company. And now, of course, we have a special grand jury impaneled to bring it all together and bring it all home. It doesn't guarantee an indictment. It doesn't guarantee criminal charges, but it, sh it surely is the last stop on the road to an indictment and all indicators are pointing toward Donald Trump and company being criminally charged. Stay tuned, folks, because uh, if ever justice matters, it's holding a criminal former president and others accountable for their crimes. If ever justice matters. Folks, as always, please stay safe. Please stay tuned. And I look forward to talking with you all again tomorrow.